lecture of today and uh, the topic is connected to the topic of the previous one even though this is going to be a presentation of a, of a specific project as you will hear in a second this project is connected with a very interesting space which is not far from the Polytechnic no? uh, in the jail near the railway and also sadly there is uh, the, the first fab lab open in Italy and uh, there are the Officina Arduino connected with the Open Hardware Board Arduino. Uh, there is also a space for co, co working called Toolbox. And that very interesting space, uh, the main things are going on, also this specific project is going on. Uh, but you will listen directly from the, uh, the person that had the idea and uh, also the, the person helping to run the project, who is a former student of the Polytechnic and student. And um, let me introduce you, Yasmina uh, Tezanov, Tezanovic or Tejanovic? Tejanovic. Tejanovic. Yasmina Tejanovic, uh, which is uh, a Serbian author, feminist, political activist, translator and filmmaker. And uh, you will find uh, uh, the list of her many works uh, uh, non-fiction, fiction, essays, uh, filmography on her um, Wikipedia webpage which is linked from, from the uh, webpage of the course. Uh, Yasmina, it's a great pleasure to have you here. Tell us all about uh, Yasmina. Personally, I'm very interested. I want to hear everything. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I'll be using yeah, thank you. Yeah, uh, this guy? One by one, sure. Yeah, okay. Okay, so hello everybody. Uh, thank you for this nice intro. I didn't write it, somebody else wrote it on Wiki, so it's almost all true. <laughs> it was sitting there. However, yes, I'm Yasmina Tashanovic. I come originally from Serbia. And right now, I'm living in Croatia. And my background, yes, I am a political activist, a feminist, a writer, a musician, a filmmaker. No, I'm not an Leonardo da Vinci. But what makes all these things possible, besides my age, I have time to try it all and be happy with it all, is that I'm the person who lives online. And ever since I was a very young person, I was tinkering with technology and doing art and politics and everything using, especially the internet when it came to be. I mean, it wasn't even called internet at the time, or blog didn't exist, it was something else. You know, it had many words. But Bruce told you about that kind of stuff, of history and evolution of what nowadays is called internet of things. Now, the first time that I did like uh, the collection of my feminist stories, they opened it on online, collective and online. They opened a the file in the police and put just one word called, said, feminist, like terrorists. No? When I was the first war blogger in the world, because I was blogging over blog did not exist at all at the time, but I got a bomb in my car. So you see, I have these brilliant ideas. And the last one, not the least, is this Casa Yasmina. It's something completely innocent, they're not dead anymore. But we do get enemies and we are trying to make friends. And that's why we have now as a team, Bruce, who is the curator, uh, Lorenzo Romagnoli, who is the master maker, he's one of the students, and I'm glad that he's with me today because I will not have the imposter syndrome that I usually have when I speak about technology because I'm not really a geek and I'm not uh, a designer. But what, what I'm meddling here with is like really high tech, future, and, and a lot of things that I don't even understand, and I hate the word user, and I will tell you how it all happened. Now, Bruce and I, we came to Torino like seven years, eight years ago, I don't even remember, we were curating share better for electronic art, and at that point we met Massimo Banzi. We already knew about Arduino, but only a few people did know about Arduino. Massimo Banzi was bigger in the US than in Italy. Finally, he got uh, <coughs> credits even here. But anyway, Torino, we came to stay a couple of months, but here we are seven, eight years staying here because Torino grew on us. And why? Because it was a beautiful city with very nice people. I can be a local patriota because I'm an Italian, so allow me to say that we chose to stay in Torino and we could have lived anywhere else, more or less. No? Because it was, a, it was an innovative city. It was potentially eccentric and high-tech city because it had Arduino and a wonderful team around, but it was, which came in later on, but as a potential, it was already there. And then after a couple of years, we said, okay, why don't we try and make our own house here in Torino? You know, like we were living in a rented flat. We didn't care much about stuff we had in the flat. You know, we're old enough to don't like to own stuff because what does stuff mean when you 
inherit the house, when you're somebody's child, only child like I am, for example, then my parents are dead, you know. You get a lot of stuff you don't know what to do with. Some is pretty, some emotionally you're tied to, and it's just cluster. And when both of us brought that stuff together, and our children have grown up and not living with us anymore, we were just living with dead people's stuff. And it was that media, of course, love that media, but I'm a minimalist. I don't like stuff, you know, it makes me cry. When I look my mom's, you know, something, it makes me cry. I can poke with mom, but I don't want to. Besides, it's 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 too much. It's too much. It's too much. So he said, "Okay, why don't we start from scratch and find something here in Torino? Flats have grown; uh, they don't cost very much. Besides, there are many abandoned buildings, as you as you may know, in Torino. You know. So he said, why don't we? Have, we didn't have much money. Why don't we find some kind of nice space, you know? And we why don't we then, you know, try to make it from scratch? Just bring the mattress there and." And I said, Bruce, well, you are a visionary. I don't mind living your visions. Even if you kill me, who will if not you? And he said, I don't mind living your vision. So we committed to each other. At the time, we were hanging out already at a co-working space <coughs> in Via Egeo, which was at its very beginning, because the internet was good there and nowhere else. So, <laughs> <laughs> yes, we couldn't get good fast, but no one was there. At least we were good internet. So we were hanging out there. And then all of a sudden, I realized that we were surrounded with this brilliant young people like Lorenzo and others, you know, who basically didn't want to have a steady job, some actually abandoned their steady job and came to work there and to experiment with this uh, high-tech uh, internet of things and other things, makers movement. Anyway, at that point, I realized that the flat I saw was completely abandoned in this Porchetto building in the IGO City. It's a beautiful building. He was a very famous architect, architect. You may know him because some of started an architect. He was famous for building bridges all over Italy. And that building was a warehouse, and then it became a Fiat warehouse. Anyway, it was not inhabited since the 80s. It was falling about, full of rats, full of pigeons, full of dirt, you know. But it was still beautiful. I said, why don't we take this flat and retrofit it? So I spoke to the owner, the guy who was handling that, and they said, you know what? It's supposed to be demolished, so you can't buy it, you know. I mean, who knows? I knew they wouldn't demolish it. So, but we have to do something. I couldn't, you know, give money to something that should be demolished. But we know, we know also that we should conquer the space, and instead of leaving it to the rats and cats, we should have to do something high tech, you know. So the idea really grew on the people in, 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 uh, in that space, first of all. And then Massimo Banti, who was with us at the time, said, that's a great idea. He said, why don't we do like make a team and do this bed and breakfast? If you can't live, you can be the guinea pigs. You can go first and try like, uh, what, what's made there. But, you know, we can make it like bed and breakfast. Designers can come in. Designers can, uh, you know, uh, we can make workshops. Everybody can contribute there. We can do something really new. And, you know, we will call it how should we call it? How should we call it? I don't know, Mina, Beth, call it on her, the white one. And then Massimo said, no, call it yes, Mina. So, I said, I, didn't, I think much, many more important things in my life, but if I die today, I'll be famous to discuss it as Mina, which is just a brand like McDonald's. I'm like, proud to be that, but that. But I will give you now the word to Lorenzo, because he will explain something very important. Because he was in uh, in the Arduino and Maker's Movement from the very first day, which is the last three years, and he will give you this presentation of the background of this big story where we come with the end. Ms. and then I'll get back to you. Okay. So. Thank you. Um, so I will, I will do a couple steps back in, uh, in the past, going back to 2011 when um, we opened during touring. Uh, with the help of again Massimo Banzi that had kind of the idea and Riccardo Luna, this first uh, Fab Lab. So, who's familiar with this idea of Fab Lab? Yeah, there are some people in the room. So, um, yeah, I mean, the space was very small, it was 5 by 5 square meter with few machines, it was very neat in the beginning and slowly we transformed it in this kind of space. It was kind of a mess with a lot of people coming uh, to build things. And actually, I think this picture is like from my first personal encounter with Bruce Sterling. So this comes from his uh, Flickr uh, account and was our first 3D printer. And so I really remember Bruce and Yasmina coming in the space and asking a lot of questions about what we were doing because, I mean, it was, we were opening this lab in this space as was an exhibition about the future of Italy 
And the idea was, okay, what can happen in the future in Italy? Yeah, it would be cool if we could open some fab labs. They're kind of famous all around the world. There are fab labs um, everywhere in Iran. There are fab labs that are not in Italy. Let's open one. And that's what we did. So the idea behind the fab lab is that there are machines to manufacture kind of everything. So you have 3D printer, you have laser cutter, you have CNC milling machines. And uh, the idea is that in order to manufacture kind of everything, it has to be easy to manufacture stuff. So those tools are digit digitally controlled. So most of the time, if you use a 3D printer, you start from a 3D file. So it's something that you can download from the internet and it materializes on your desk. So in 2011, it was kind of futuristic to think about 3D printer. Now uh, I'm kind of sick of 3D printers everywhere, people that keep on uh, 3D printed keychains and a bit of everything. But actually, it's, um, it became a big thing. Um, this lab brand, we run a lot of workshops, a lot of Arduino workshops inside the space, lots of school, like from the architecture faculty, there were always students coming in, laser cutting models and stuff like that. But after the nine months of the exhibition, we had to close, and we started looking for a new place. So, um, Toolbox, this co-working space in Turin, told us, hey, you know, we have plenty of space have this huge building. You could come there and do the things you, you can do. So you bring in the machine and again, uh, when we got it, it was kind of white and clean and then it started being a little bit more uh, messed up with more people coming, of course, with more projects, with more tools, more machines and so on. So, um, I think was also the moment that another thing started appearing because in the beginning there was just this Fab Lab. It was called Fab Lab Italia and then when we moved we decided to call it Fab Lab Torino as the Fab Lab in Italy were growing a lot. We couldn't keep the name of Fab Lab Italia just because we were the first one. So we said okay we are Fab Lab Torino. And we were people doing the, the same thing. So like the, behind the idea was there was always this idea of also sharing the knowledge about how to use the tools and um, sharing ideas, working together. In the end, the Fab Lab is an association. So people come in with their projects and they kind of try to help each other building projects and then there is an old system of credit. So if you uh, run a workshop, you get credits that you can use to use the machines and stuff like that. So, what comes out of the Fab Lab are this kind of stuff. So, uh, chairs that are laser cutters, like this is a cool project by the former president of the Fab Lab. It's uh, from Eric Kobasi. It's a, it's a bicycle that got uh, customly designed and milled. Um, then there are some people that think, um, yeah, you know, there, there was this project is, a, is by another designer that comes to our Fab Lab. He, in his idea, it's not his idea, he was saying, I mean, uh, wheelchairs for sport, for doing sports, are super expensive because they are made in carbon fire, fiber, and you have to pay like a thousand euros so a kid cannot train on this kind of stuff. So you cannot have a um, not professional kind of uh, handicapped basketball player. So he designed this stuff that costs around 100 to 100 euros because it's made in a lab and he opened all the documentation that is required to do this kind of stuff. So it's a place where people come and do things. And then on the next, on the, on the first floor, as I was saying before, it comes this Officina Arduino. Uh, in 2011, when we opened this place, Arduino didn't have a, a real office. Uh, but because we were kind of opening this place, it was a physical place, because uh, if you want to make stuff, you need a place to be. It's not like, till when you do digital uh, website and digital contents, you can live everywhere and just publish your stuff online. 
when you are when you want to do physical stuff and Arduino is pretty much about physical stuff and the fab lab is all physical, you need a space. So that's when Arduino opened the, the office, the first Arduino office here in Turin, on top floor of the uh, Fab Lab Torino. And there always has been this very close collaboration between Fab Lab and Officina Arduino. So some people might think it's the same thing. They're actually uh, two different things that coexist and work pretty well together. Um, but maybe I'm talking about Arduino uh, and someone doesn't know what it is. Right? Does anyone know what an Arduino is? Some people know. Okay, so Arduino is a couple of things. So first of all, it's, it's a board. Uh, it's an electronic board for doing uh, interactive projects. So the, then of course it's a software and it's a big community. So I will skip this a couple of that. So what's the basic idea? So this is an old model of, of an Arduino. It works like this. You get the board, you get electronic components like sensors, actuators, screens, motors, uh, radio, communication devices, whatever. You connect it together and the cool thing is that there is plenty of documentation on how to do it because, because as I was saying before, the, the cool feature of Arduino is that um, it is well documented and there is a great community that contributes to this documentation. You run the code and then things start happening. So this is a, a project done by some students at uh, CIAD in, uh, in Copenhagen. Um, of course you need to write some code to make, to make it work, but the good thing is that the code is so, it's super easy. So in order to blink an LED, if someone is used to work with uh, registers and other kind of micro microcontrollers, you're supposed to set registers and talks in bits <coughs> and bytes. While programming in Arduino is very simple and quite high level, so that even uh, kids uh, do it. So, I mean, if you want to look up uh, great content, check out this super, Sylvia Superpose on Maker Show. She is, I mean, she was 11 some years ago, so probably now she's 13, but she does great shows where she teaches electronics in a very uh, easy way using all of those LEDs that look like stuff like that. So, in 2005, when it came out, there was nothing similar, nothing uh, as easy to use. But this was not the main core that brought it to, to, to the success that it has, because at the moment it became kind of the standard for building interactive objects. What it made it made it really famous is this being open source. So, we can say that it's probably one of the first example of open source hardware that actually um, made a real business uh, with it. And by being open source, it means that in 2005, after they, uh, they, they made the first batch, they say, okay, the file are here, if you want to copy it, if you want to make your own, if you want to improve it, please do. So, of course, a lot of derivative boards came out uh, and are still coming out. A lot of boards that are called Freeduino, Arduino, they love to add this Eno extension to the, to the word. Um, but this being open source and this allowing everyone to copy and reproduce it also um, made it very very easy for people to understand and for people to create documentation on it. Because of course, if you get a, I don't know, another super close platform, you don't, you're not super willing to create documentation on that kind of stuff because you don't feel like you're contributing to something that's not yours. While if this is an open source project, you know you can reproduce it on your own you want to give to the community, you want to contribute, and, and so on and so on. 
So this was an important aspect. The other cool aspect is that it can be plug and play. So there is this, uh, they invented this idea of having shields that you can plug on top of your, of your Arduino to give more potentiality, such as a node to something to connect motors, to have it wireless, uh, run on the internet, and so on and so on. And you can, again, build your own shields and stuff like that. And yeah, again, as I was saying, this documentation, it's, it's booming. Whatever you want to do with an Arduino, uh, if you Google it, you will find information about how to do it. So yeah, people are making drones, people are making 3D printers, music, musical instruments. A lot of creative work is happening. And a lot of creative work is happening because it is easy to use and you don't have to be an engineer to use it. That's kind of a very important feature. Um, yeah, for example, this, this is a, a very good example project. It's a, it's a toy. It's an open source toy to teach kids uh, how to program. And um, yeah, so you have those little blocks that you can plug on this platform and then a little kind of car called Lucubento that you have to drive around so that kids learn the logic of the programming. And the good thing is that this project came out uh, of our fab lab and then this guy made a Kickstarter campaign to finance this project and then it got founded and now uh, he is delivering his shipping, his product. So it's really cool that with, with an open source project he developed an open source product that was founded in an open way with the community and now uh, he is delivering it to the world and the cool thing is that he's also asking people to um, develop further the project and make derivative works out of it uh, and upload it again on his website so that he wants to create this kind of sort of community around the project of people that can develop it further. Um, yeah, another cool thing done with an Arduino is this one. It's the same 3D printer we saw before. In, down in there, there is a 3D printer. There is a, an Arduino, sorry. And, uh, okay, so this is a small parenthesis about the importance of, uh, of open source. So, if we look at this graph, uh, you see the, uh, the amount of time the word 3D printing appeared in scientific publication between 1985 and 2012. So, as you can see, um, it started in, in the 85. 1985, someone started writing something on paper about 3D printing. Uh, can someone guess what happened between 1985 and the year kind of 2000? Because, as you can see, it starts again from here, probably. Can someone guess? I will plug the battery in black. Anyone? Yes. 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 What happened? <laughs> Ideas? <laughs> no. Does <laughs> Mina, do you know? No, I know, I know. I just have a question for our answers. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, that could have been a cause, but actually, if they made something that they call a 3D printer by then, that meant that probably the way I might have controlled it that people could use. Yeah, I mean, Arduino started in 2005. It might have helped, but I, I don't know. Yeah, I don't think that's uh, that's the thing because in 2005 probably no one knew Arduino. It, for the in 2007, no one kind of used it apart from some few design schools. Okay, we tell you. Uh, they, it is because if you know, like, uh, how long does the patent last? Like the the time span of a patent is kind of 25 years, right? 20. 20. So for 20 years no one could uh, use the same technology that was patented in 
1985. So, if we continue with a quote uh, from Professor uh, Angelo Fedemeo, which is here from Polytechnic of Torino, uh, yeah, I mean, we, we really understand how, how a patent in this era can really stop innovation. Because, uh, I mean, as you as say, uh, a 25 year term uh, of patent is nowadays dated. Uh, we should have patents uh, that uh, could, could last for six months and it would be already, already a lot. So, um, yeah, I mean, I kind of think uh, in the same way uh, as him regarding patents and regarding the uh, that they have on innovation. Um, so, yeah, I mean, meanwhile, going back to the Fab Lab, it got quite big and this major movement kind of boomed. Uh, there are Fab Lab everywhere. In Italy now, there are probably around 80s lab that kind of recognize themselves as fab labs and you, you, could, have, you could really see that uh, last October at Maker Fair uh, in Rome was a huge event with uh, lots of people, lots of enthusiasts uh, coming to see uh, this kind of innovation, this innovation bit for everyone uh, I like to, to think of um, so that it's accessible put it this way. And yeah, so people are saying this is a, a new industrial revolution. Um, and of course there are economies that are growing uh, along this new revolution. So in this case, uh, this is a good example is Open Desk. As there are some designers, friends of us that were here in Turin last week. Um, presenting at Maker Fair because we had last week a Maker Fair, a mini Maker Fair game in Turin. It's quite fun. Um, yeah, and the open book as he has me. Huh? So, what they do is that they design a table and they have a whole platform where designers can upload design. And then you go to the platform and you can download the, the source file, go to the Fab Lab next to your door, the makerspace, and have it manufactured there. So, this is really kind of shifting also this uh, paradigm of the production, because production becomes local, uh, designers get rewarded, and even if a designer manufacturer just one piece, can get a reward according to how, much, how many people download it. It's the same for Tinyverse and so on and so on. But, so this is, so while Bruce introduced like half of uh, the framework that, uh, that gave the start to this Casa uh, Yasmina project, this one, the world of the makers, the digital manufacturing, uh, Arduino, as kind of the other half. Because in fact what happened is that during those three years we kind of uh, yeah, mixed together those two uh, those two contexts, of course, with Arduino you work a lot with in the field of uh, IoT, but the Fab Lab is more about uh, fabricating stuff. And uh, at some point, I guess also this question arises: like, okay, we have technology, we can build a bit of everything, but yeah, where is my connected fridge? So this is a question that, like, Massimo. Um, like to us, so saying that there are a lot of IoT devices. I mean, every year at CES, and, uh, a new connected fridge come out, but we never see the right into our home because most of them they don't make sense. They don't make sense to the, u to the user. Most of the time, it just means that they have really internet in it, such as they have a, a browser in the in the front panel and that doesn't really add much. So we thought can we kind of have design or help this process of bringing the makers uh, make new connected products that actually make sense and they are for for the people. So yeah I mean that's where kind of 
because I just mean I'm going to skip a couple of slides because Bruce talked enough about uh, the IoT. Yeah, you want to? Uh, no, no, I will, I will, I will skip. So um, yeah, we just I'll say something about this. So, what we are seeing now in terms of connected devices is that we see a lot of very vertical apps, very very vertical design. So you have um, you have an object, you have a smartphone and an app for the object, and uh, uh, that app connects to that device. And uh, and again, it's a problem because you transform your phone in a huge remote control uh, that doesn't help you making your life easier, but you need to find the right app for, for everything and that's not uh, what we want to have, why we think that this Internet of Things is more, it will happen when we are going to be able to kind of more seamlessly connect those different aspects, so uh, it's network, there are places, there are objects, there are data, there are devices, there are users. and. They are all connected. Um, so, of course, there are, as we said, people like Google and Apple and many other big players that are trying to do this. And we said, yeah, why not try with kind of makers, DIY tools to uh, kind of propose our way. And, and we want to do it because we believe that. Um, also, a creative approach and giving tools to uh, designers and artists to propose their vision of the future will lead to different solutions not, that are not the ones that are proposed by engineers that always think about um, making things more effective. Okay? So, I will show you this little clip. Probably. There is no audio. But just to say um, how much we can we can envision possible futures that maybe okay let's let's have a look. No wait, maybe it's better if we can we connect the audio? So if you put your mic in front of the speaker, right?
couple of things that I want to stress. This is open source. The open source is a different political way of coping with objects and with things. Uh, uh, Arduino is the possibility of reducing the price of the new system from 30,000 euros, nobody can afford it, maybe 3,000 euros or 300 euros, I hope so. I'm still an optimist, I still believe in an alternative economy because the collapse of the moment of, of capitalism, of this capitalism that has collapsed in 2008 and life goes on and people still want to live and people are still born and young people need stuff. So, when I was thinking about Casa Yasmina, among other things, I was also thinking about uh, making uh, some kind of domotica alternative economic model. And I was thinking it also, not for users, as I say, because I hate the word users, I was thinking it for people. I was thinking for making, putting human values into technology. Meaning what? Meaning, first of all, children and elderly people. Meaning for people who need help who need technology not as a science fiction thing for fun, but as a, something as a necessity, not as a luxury. So when I wanted this luxury moment to become a necessity moment, and as a consequence of this, we have to think of a new design, which will be friendly for people and not for users. You don't have to do seven switches in order to do a simple thing. You need to think about something which will make your life more comfortable, prettier, more cozy, less expensive, no? And this, you know, uh, this is something that we cannot predict. High technology, science fiction technology, Bruce knows because he wrote many novels when he was writing what the future will result like. And then, as he says himself, very few things work out and come true. And maybe they're the most important things in the world, maybe are the less important, the least important things in the world, but we cannot predict which of these inventions that we're trying to do in Casa Yasmina, you know, uh, will really become a part of our everyday life. Because everyday culture determines what somebody wants to use. It won't be the prettiest thing, it won't be the cheapest thing, it won't be the most intelligent thing. It will be something that people of local society will like to use and will come handy for them to use. So in this sense, we are combining something which is like high technology, which is very American, and Bruce is very American, and I come from a sort of third world where we have to have high technology in order to survive. I use not only to change a ball, but to make a ball, because I lived for years on that without the ball. You know, and even though I'm a woman, I have to learn how to do it in order to survive, you know. And something which is Italian way of life. Italian way of life has become the model of the best way of life. You know, we live to be 100 here, you know, and you still smoke and drink, you know, like crazy, and I love that, you know. And what's the idea? The idea of the combination of Italian way of life and high technology to find this uh, way of, different way of living. Now, in order to be wanting, in order to live in a different way, one wants to live, needs to want to change, you know, but one cannot change rather you know, nobody can change rather. Nobody changes at all. What we do, we just evolve on the course of our life. Meaning, what I want in Casa Yasmina is to have material objects too. My brand is garbage. I want to have a nice object. But on the other hand, I really want to something which makes my life a cleaner, you know, something that cleans my house or that kind of bad. When we when I made, made the first movie of the robot, what's his name? Robo, Robo. Rumba. Rumba, yeah. Uh, Rumba, no? When, uh, Rumba. When I made a video of Rumba, an 80-year-old woman from inner Serbia, her granddaughter showed her the Rumba, you know, and she said, I love him. He's so cute. First of all, she said, he's cute, meaning he's not an ugly robot. Second thing she said, oh, I wouldn't have to bend you know, in order to clean my house. She needs it to be clean. And third, she said, I can be dependent how much does it cost? Because she can't afford the nanny, somebody, you know, to pay with her pension to clean for her and cook for her. So you see, it's not like she's not a user, she's a person who needs a room. But the control of technology, the democratic control of technology, is very, very complicated because of Apple, Google, and all these the consortium that are coming up. So what we have to do is, we have to make our own cloud too, no? And we're speaking at Massimo Banzi, how our smart house, or maybe less smart house, how we will be the owners of, I'm the hostess of the house, that's my official title, we will do really nice stuff, parties, drink, and do everything, you know? It will be a nice house, it will be a fun house more than a smart house. I put that in the first plan, huh? 
But how can he make it also uh, private, in a sense, not controlled? I watched uh, a video, many videos the other day, and I spent like 10 hours watching it. Uh, one of the last and most important cyber feminist conference, I don't know where it was held, however, there were feminists from 25 to 75, you know, speaking about uh, new technologies, you know, and there were designers, feminists, artists, theorists, you know, there were women. And, you know, I was amazed how much two words dominated all the time, you know, fear and privacy. And I said, what am I doing here? You know, I, I'm like, I'm not afraid of technology and I don't think so much about privacy, but basically they know more than I do, you know. And women are more concerned with privacy, you know. And women are more um, ex exposed to fear because their privacy is more attacked than men's privacy. Here we go. You know, you know that, you know. I don't have to teach you the basic courses of, of, of like there was one artist, feminist artist who's, who just made a, 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 a statistic, like how many women Technological artists uh, uh, had an exhibition last year in Roma, zero, zero, zero. And all this, you know, was zero. Only one place had one woman who exhibited. So meaning, you know, it's something that is still very far away from women. At that point, I realized also, apart from users that we don't want to use, but we want to have people and we want to worship children who would define this new products and projects we want to do. And they're going to be handled by people like him and others. I, real, and I realized that also in this scene, which was new for me, you know, when we jumped into this thing, was that there were many women around sitting like, like him, not maybe 50% here are women. Like in the major scene, they are 50%. But they're silent. They don't say, you know, they just work behind the scene. When I ask them questions, they say, well, we need more time to think. And then when I ask them, like, do you think in a different way? Like, why do you, don't you say anything? You know, they said, because maybe we think in a different way, but this technology is still very made. Now, Casa Yasmina, it's a home. So it has to be home. It has to be like the universe, your little universe, your big, your own universe. So I'm not saying it's only women, you know, but I'm saying still women are those who most of the time take care of their children, not to say that they're pregnant, you know, and that. For example, very often, like last time we had opening because Yasmina, a pregnant woman told me that she cannot find a cradle which has the height for a woman, she's a small woman, but it's like a cradle too high. Do you understand if you make a smart cradle and you make it too high, she won't even see her baby, you know? <laughs> because these are like problems, you know, that you can So these women, they were telling me how they have a feeling that they could do, they could come to some solutions which are more women friendly, but they need some kind of separate space. You know, some kind of initiative that we cannot, we could not even individualize. We could even find the words that were connected to Casa Yasmina as a women's project. But we did find uh, the, the name of the movement that we are going to launch now, which is called Internet of Women Things. I okay, show the show the electric girl. At the end. So this is a designer from Torino. You see, and we made uh, he he was. Uh, he was, I don't know, he designed some kind of lot, he had a lot of posters from the 20s. So we packed his poster, took out some colors, and you see there, are the, there is the women of internet things. And this thing, which is the most common question, like everybody asks us, connected to what? You know, because when you say connected to apartment, you mean, actually, you know, what is the answer connected with? Such a complicated answer, I was just letting go in, so I can't explain to anybody, not even to myself. But we, Kind of try to, to, to simplify it and said that we will you know find those uh, how to say free spaces, empty spaces in domotica, in technology, which will make our lives more simple, more beautiful, like the world manifesto. Anyway, we're gonna make a call for uh, women makers. Uh, I've, I've been presenting this idea in conferences lately, and there are many women who want to participate. We we're gonna send out the, the, the form. And we're going to ask women thinkers, women designers. I mean, you can be also a man if you can think from the women's point of view. It's not about genetic biology, you know. I just want to point out the cultural differences because, as Donna Haraway used to say, uh, women gather around affinities and men gather around ideologies and identities. Women have a more mobile uh, identity, meaning. 
Women want work to be done. They don't care if you're a boss in the job. They don't care if it's the most ecologically brilliant way. They just want it to be done in a nice, simple, and efficient way. So this is the kind of solution I really liked when I was reading about this women's desire for most wives or children or, or, uh, or, or uh, you know, of famous designers. Like there are many famous couples and the woman is always behind the screen because because you see this, especially technological design, is always connected as a you know, nowadays. So uh, we were going to make this platform and we will invite uh, all of you to participate, you know, and send us your ideas from questions to answers. And now I'm going to give the word to, to Lorenzo because I think what's important is that he now explains to us um, what we already put in the house and how much, because I guess, how much of this, uh, because we also have makers, hope for makers of Casa Yasmina, and how much of this, nothing is open source 100%. But what can Bruce said once, keeps repeating, Let's find an object that can be 100% open source. Just one thing, and we will put it in as well. But let's see how we can open source everything, you know. And how can you open source, for example, a TV, any one TV? How can you open source, you know, this is for me a very interesting question. Because it really leads, as Lorenzo said, to this uh, collective intelligence solutions, you know. And when it comes to do so for at home, I think nobody really will be, how to say, bothered if we share a model of home, and if our home here in Italy, the Italian culture model of Casa Yasmina differs from Casa Gerta in Germany, or Casa, Casa Boyana in Serbia, you know, it will be because technology has its own way in a different culture, you know, and in a different economic society. So what we're doing now is we're setting the basis for something that can fortunately be used as a model somewhere else, and we're trying to be to survive it with dignity. Okay, so yeah, I mean, yeah, this is Bruce inside the apartment. Some time yes, ago, when the, when the they were with the Serbian hand, when they were, no, I mean, it was still old and uh, to be renovated. This is kind of the plan. I mean, it's, it's a normal apartment, it's two bedrooms and a kitchen, a living room. But this is also the cool part. I mean, it's a normal apartment. We are making the apartment of the, few, of the future, but not too far in the future. And we are making it kind of normal, so that everyone can reproduce it in, um, for themselves. So as Yasmina was actually saying, we have this few ingredients uh, that are the digital fabrication, so all the stuff that we can do in the fab lab right downstairs. The apartment, the electronics, the open source electronic Arduino you know, mixed with the Italian design that are kind of the three elements the, that we are trying to combine to to have different things inside the apartment. So it's it's not that the apartment is over. The apartment it's a, it's a long process. It's going to last. Its project is going to last for two or three years, and it's going to be a test bed. We're going to we are going to install new products, we are going to test new products inside. It's an exhibition space, so we want to exhibit uh, good stuff uh, or bad stuff that we are trying to, to renovate and make better. And it's also going to be a guest house, so we want people to go in, come in Casa Yasmina, live in it, uh, test the stuff, give us, give us feedback and help us building the space together. Um, and we and we we are not trying to build it all on our own. So it's an open process. We are not it's not Arduino saying okay we're gonna design the best open source apartment that you can think of. No, we are trying to work with people, do many more for projects, and even get industry involved in our process. So we will probably never be able in the fab lab to build the best washing machine or a washing machine that actually works so why not work with people that are already doing washing machines and we want to work with them and make their approach a bit more open and so that we can kind of 
share something. We share our uh, innovative way of hacking electronics, of uh, making stuff quicker, of designing uh, interfaces and experience that actually make sense. And they put their expertise in making electronics. So um, the idea also to have a lot of electronic manufacturers also because we want to promote a, a, a standard for interoperability, interoperability between devices that is as open as possible. So having a house is also kind of a trap because we having multiple manufacturers of uh, white goods and selling their stuff will mean eventually that they're going to have to collaborate, dialogate in finding a, a kind of an open standard or a way to go to each other. So, yeah, I mean, those are some pictures from the workshop we did on designing connected lamps. We are throwing uh, events, and by the way, now it looks like we are finished. It looks like this. These are, those are pictures from uh, the opening. We have, uh, we have a cool kitchen inside given by an Italian cuisine, an Italian manufacturer, and we are ready to hack it and uh, modify and connect it to something, if we can. Um, we have uh, some open desk furniture inside, we have some bookshelf. Um, from the call for makers, some project came out, so we have some uh, garden furniture, we have some uh, devices to control the moist of the plant, we have a, um, a, a, a thing to grow this spirulina, the, the algae that it's kind of very good uh, and you can, you can drink. Um, we had an exhibition of this um, white goods offered by this um, energy atom consortium that is a consortium from Turi that works here next door and works on connecting devices for the whole environment. We had a selection of open source, uh, not open source, but connected or digital art pieces or even by the SHARE festival, that is another um, yeah, festival uh, that happens here in Turin. So we are pretty much trying to uh, work together with a lot of parties that are radicated, radicated in, the, uh, in Torino, in this environment. In kind of bring it, and try to bring as many people as possible in this in this space. So now uh, the renovation is almost over. There are still some details that have to be fixed and some stuff that has to, some desk that have to be ascended and stuff like that. But soon we're gonna start. Uh, we're gonna put beds in it and uh, we're gonna open up to to the real public that will be able to. Uh, to come see it uh, and talk to us about what we are doing and discuss with us about this future, the future of this project, right? So, I mean, it's yeah, Bruce went away for the difficult part because I mean, after, <laughs> after saying all the things about, about, about the Internet of Things, then he ran away and said, Yeah, you present the project. It's still about the Internet of Things. <laughs> but yeah. Bruce wants to say something, or we have some questions because he's actually very active in this project. We just like to do the. the, the okay. Thank you. <laughs> you know, what, we have a lot of ideas for this space. We have more ideas than we could ever possibly execute in like three to five years. But you know, it's very uh, it's very hard to get see the people I actually kind of contributing stuff to it. It's a bit of a nail soup thing. You know, like we have a soup pot, we have a nail, and other people are bringing us like the potatoes and carrots. Uh, but uh, you know, it's very important to us that this should be a uh, not just a house of the future, but one with intensely Turinese characteristics. So, so as soon as we've got the bench set up, we're gonna go live there. Yeah. Every single object in the space will be personally tested by myself. 
And yes, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, we're going to be spending a lot of time in here at some home, and this is your hostess. I must say that I was very... Shh. <laughs> I was very glad when Samantha, Astro Samantha, tweeted us. <laughs> the opening of Casa Yasmina said, this is, now we have to keep up to her standards. <laughs> Uh, do, you, do you have any questions, please? If you don't, I'm okay with it. <laughs> yes. Thank you for your presentation. It was an excellent presentation. I think it would be a great project. Uh, I'm doing my research in, in design. And my, my main uh, area of uh, designing a smart for the first smart home. Oh, you did? Yeah, I'm doing. <laughs> I'm doing very good to begin. Uh, I was um, just wondering if you're going to choose what to design for Casa Jasmina, and this per and this uh, particular thing is connected to other particular things. Uh, uh, what methodology do you use? For example, what do, what do you decide, uh, what kind of uh, object uh, you design and which one? Well, uh, it's obvious that we have to have the objects we need in the home. Huh? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, everybody who started designing the Arduino is always the lamp, so we got really many lamps and really many beautiful proposals when we uh, made the makers uh, thing for, for a lamp, you know. But uh, I don't think the lamps are the only thing we need. For example, I want to just say this as an anecdote. I don't know how many uh, of you, I, I, I see that many of you never heard of Arduino, you know, which is really a shame because you should. There is a small book of, uh, that Massimo wrote uh, some years ago, many years ago, actually. And it was uh, like working with elementary Arduino. And I am not, I have no technological background. And trust me, I don't know what's in my car. I don't care, you know. I don't care what's in my washing machine. I'm a writer. But I, I have a problem with plots. When I write a book, I always have this plot which runs away from me and a very bad plot, you know. And when I read this book, Arduino, of what's inside Arduino, and do it yourself, and make your own objects, all of a sudden I realized that not only that I can do my object, but I can also write a novel following his principles. Meaning, you don't have to be an engineer in order to make what you need in your home. I mean, the, the plotting system is amazing. So, why am I telling you this? That like, the objects, uh, what kind of objects? You say, now, we will, uh, the first workshop we do, I think we're doing with Katarina Tiazzoli, who had, she's an uh, architect and a designer, you know. She's from Torino, she teaches in Colombia. And she had this idea of uh, doing these things of, of a household, you know, of a simple household that we use every day, like simple objects. But what I don't like is to uh, treat women as women who clean and, and wash, you know. But everybody does, every household needs it on the other hand. So, but what I'm here discussing that also as a house of future or, or as a house of my present is that I realize many things I don't need to do. Many objects I don't really need, you know, many stuff we really don't need. So, in this designing the objects, I would like to rethink every object we are using every day. That's my part of being the host of the Yashmina. Is, do we really need this bottle? Or maybe there's some other way of not making plastic bottles. Plastic is bad for the environment. Maybe we should get water in some old connected way. Or it's always explain it to me, how can I get water from the fountain, no? Immediately to my favorite cup, which I will make, and keep it cold without like using the fridge and wasting electricity, you know? Uh, this is very ambitious, of course, and I'm speaking like someone who does nothing. But, you know, sometimes these ambitious ideas from somebody who is not, uh, as he said, I may not be practical, but maybe my ideas can give some people's practical ways uh, good idea. So this collaboration. So when you start, what kind of job? I'll just say, I don't know. Something that I will need, that you will need, that, and that my newborn child, I was wanting a baby, we just born a couple of days ago with my friend, you know, and I said that, that she will need, okay? Because I live so much in a different way from my mom and from my daughter. You see, my daughter, my mom is dead, my daughter is third. But we have different habits, different, we use different stuff. We, for example, I don't iron anymore. You know, this guy, do we need really an iron in our household? 
No, maybe probably, but I, you know, we need iron stuff, so we need different tissue. Do we need tende? Do we need uh, curtains? I don't know if we need curtains. We just need something to be protected from light, you know. If you need, for example, like I don't like it because I just mean that screens. I don't like screens, but I want to have uh, walls where I can watch, uh, like, uh, where I can Netflix. I want to have Netflix and I want to have a wall, or I have to have, I, I would love to have an invisible screen. You know? And somebody told me, Bruce, you told us, some desire that invisible screen can, make out, can be made out of fuel, fumo, you know, out of, uh, out of smoke. Yes. So you see, it is all possible. I don't want to have a material screen, you know. So when you think about something, just think about that way and send us your permit. So would you ask, uh, uh, would you ask from people what they need, or you run workshops about some particular cases? And well, uh, we still didn't do anything with that, but so I don't know what we're going to do. But I think that the first phase is going to be discussing. You know, we first want to see uh, is there any common ground on given desire about yeah, something that gives us a or if we disagree and where we disagree. And then my idea is to group objects which we need and want. So, but if you have your idea, you know, I mean, like, it's fine. I, I don't, I, I don't like it to be a, to, a, a topic with a, a, a like a closed topic. Like everybody has to make you laugh. No, and then you think between you. No, I think it should be more like, uh, what do you think? You're a maker, master. He's gonna, he's really popular. What do you think? How do you do it? So. Yeah, I mean, uh, deciding where to start is kind of a, a, a tricky. Uh, it's, a, it's a tricky point because I mean we have an empty apartment and for me that I'm a designer it's very difficult to uh, figure out what's, what's most important, where where can we start from. Um, I'm, we, what we are trying to do since the resources inside uh, the, the, our team, the main team, it's, are kind of limited, we are planning to invite as many guest designers or artists to do residences in the house as possible and trying with this also to start conversation on uh, with them on uh, what actually uh, yeah starting from what everyone has already made uh, having them over one week and get the collaboration start the collaboration and decide with them what to do so that the idea is to that both their expertise, we put our expertise in digital manufacturing, in electronics and so on, and together with we we will run the project. So that's that's kind of the way we are trying to do it. Thank you. Other questions? Okay, so um, I 
mean, in the lab, there is really everyone. From people that don't have any uh, technical knowledge on like programming or electronics, that are just there to use the machine, they draw something on their favorite uh, design software, they go to the laser cutter, they make it, and it's not about electronics, and there are the people that are uh, electrical, that are engineers, and come there and use their skills and use Arduino because people love Arduino because it is easy to use. So if you have to make a project in five minutes because you want to test your idea, I mean, when I say I'm a, I'm a designer, I'm an industrial designer, I'm not an electrical, electronical, electronic engineer or stuff like that, that I can design my, my controller, um, and I don't want to do that. But what I like to do is to transform my ideas and to, into real stuff that work. Yeah, and to do so. With the Arduino. So exactly. Yeah. Only Arduino. You only Arduino. I do it with Arduino, I can design my yeah, custom stuff sometimes, but I, 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 I base the stuff on the 80 mega because it's you have plenty of libraries and you, you write Arduino code that, that I like and it's uh, easy to use. And I'm not saying that all the stuff that we're going to have in the house are going to be Arduino based, for sure not. Uh, but I'm pretty sure that that's a very good tool to Allow, that allows almost everyone to develop a prototype or bring its idea to life. Um, and for the fact that you also design the real PCB and the software. Yeah, you can. It depends where where, where you want to stop. If it's a, if it's a piece that you are just to make uh, one and it has to run for two weeks, you can even stick everything inside a box with a brand word and an Arduino. Why do you want to prototype a real PCB? I mean, if you have to make a production, then of course. <laughs> ah, inside, of course. So the fact that there is this people, upstairs it's the Arduino people. So the people that develop the hardware and the Arduino software, there are electrical engineers that The Fabla is an association. association. Yeah. So it's. Uh, uh, yeah. 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 We also have a big Fabla, uh, but it's an association. There are engineers. There are. Uh, there is a bit of everyone. Like there are elderly. There are kids coming to the Fabla. It's. It's an association where a lot of enthusiasts. There are musicians. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah, I want to do, uh, it's not an amateur, amateur show. On the yeah. contrary, I talk to some. No, no, I know, I know, you know, I know what you're talking about. On the contrary, I talk to some of the people who even work with some, like uh, Giacomo, you know, he's an engineer. He's not a product engineer, Giacomo, you know, he's a backup, you know, Giacomo Leones, yeah. Well, anyway, uh, when I talk to these people, basically they did have mainstream careers, no? But they didn't, they were not happy in something. Maybe they got money and security, you know. But what they didn't like is this, uh, you know, not being able to experiment. So basically, they're a very wild bunch down there, you know. Everybody comes from a kind of different background, but they had some uh, a freelance idea that have no yet names or market also. And this is like an interesting meeting point for me, you know, like I'm a freelance all my life. I couldn't define what I'm doing and who I am and what's my identity, and I don't care. You know, I'm good, I feel good this way, you know. And I think uh, the, the, the Bob Lab and Arduino has this atmosphere. As I said, like, different, mostly brilliant people who are ready to try anything and fail if necessary, you know. And, and it's an autonomous economic organization. You know, all these people basically live on their own work and without uh, being commercial, you know, without selling out themselves. That's also a very important aspect. Also, Kaza Yasmin is very careful in what way gets grants, they get them. So we're not changing our profile, we're changing those who gave us the money. When we're changing them if we can, no, not taking, you know. This is also very, this is, a, so it's a kind of a mob of different creativity which makes you stay happy, you know, not, not uh, sell your mind to somebody and lose the track of product that you made like in Apple or in Google. Hmm? Okay.
What is uh, your attitude uh, towards the cloud? Because today, uh, IT products uh, have uh, as a main component the cloud, and there are a lot of criticism by the tractors of current business models adopted by uh, who, um, by those who um, commercialize IoT products. So, um, are you trying to avoid cloud as far as possible? And uh, if yes, in what way? Or are you trying to develop a fair cloud? And if yes, <laughs> in what way again? I can probably get it. In uh, Arduino, we, we are working on these things that uh, once was called Arduino Cloud, now we, we are kind of changing the name to it. But the idea is that we are trying to create the cloud, but it's kind of different. So the, the, one of the main ideas is that for a lot of services that you want to run, especially in a home, you don't have to have it connected to a real to a cloud that is outside your home uh, that harvests your data and uh, stuff like that but it can just be inside your home uh, and it's kind of open source and it's you know it's there, it's kind of secure so that's what we are trying to work on some system of clouds that can be in your home and is located uh, somewhere else if you need it your cloud to someone else's cloud, but it's really about trying to be, you know, within the actual system of like the lab computer is also very vertical, so you have the Google Cloud, the Facebook Cloud, and the, the whatever cloud, and they cannot uh, interconnect to each other or exchange very little between each other. We are trying to work on ways to have interoperabilities and connections between different clouds by different providers. In fact, yeah, I mean, it's what you can see by like lately, Arduino has been uh, agreeing with few partners uh, on working in this direction. So we are trying to work with a lot of companies that want to work in, to be open source and work in the open source world and before working together and kind of creating kind of open standards for interoperability. So we, it's kind of cool that by being a, that, that companies like Microsoft, they, they, they always been against like openness at any level, now they are slowly, it seems like they want to change and become uh, next to us asking uh, how they should start to be paid. so that's why we started collaborating with you. Okay, other questions uh, for our guests? Any final comments? Any final comments from your part? Well, uh, uh, <coughs> <laughs> you know, I think, no. yeah, I'm okay. Yeah. You want to yeah. one, one, one. You first want to have a final comment? Yeah, maybe. Maybe. Um, you know, since you've been looking at this picture here, I thought that since I'm the curator of Casa Yasmina, I would describe some of the objects in here, and maybe that would, you know, help you understand the sensibility. Okay, that bookcase there is a uh, parametric wall divider by Caterina Piazzoldi from Torino. She was the designer for the uh, uh, toolbox co-working space. She built that in 2008. She was kind enough to lend it to us. Then the uh, chairs and the table there from Open Desk in London, various designers from around the world. Uh, I really like these chairs and tables because people aren't used to the idea of open source furniture. So they're used to the idea of furniture that you have to build yourself because you can get that at Ikea. But you now, as soon as people walk into this space and they look at this table and these chairs and they see the way they, they're put together, they understand it in about 30 seconds. I mean, it's really pretty fast. It's kind of a Lego furniture thing happening there. And you know, and it's real furniture. I mean, it really stands up. You really sit in it. People are working on it. 
you can see that it's set up designed for use with the internet. It has this kind of slot. There's rooms for cables to come to this work table. Uh, behind the gentleman's head is our zoetrope. We have a, a zoetrope from the uh, Museo uh, del Cinema here, in the Cinema Museum. And we're running uh, you know, little antique gifts in there. You do you know, a little, little bit of analog, analog animation in our old media zoetrope. These framed objects are 3D printed artworks. Uh, and the books they're reading are works on electronic art. The yellow book there is a book on Jean Tanglay and Bruno Minari, who were you know, early machine artists from the 1920s, 30s, 40s. And we see ourselves as, you know, very much in that line. I mean, there's, there's a long tradition of science and technology art. And it's not merely that we are amateurs as, as compared to engineers. On the contrary, we're like open source crafts people. And there's really a lot of that around. And there's kind of more of it in Italy than there is anywhere else. And I see that as a regional competitive advantage here. I mean, what I'm looking for more than anything else is LUSO open source, open source luxury. Because Italy does luxury manufacturers and they do it for export. And there's a lot of open source all over the world, but you know, if Turin is to put itself on the map, it's going to do open source at the Turinese component. And you know, there, there are plenty of other fab labs in the world. There are you know, dozens in Italy alone. But this is going to be, I think, you know, in two years, a really rather elegant domestic space. It's just, you know, it's not going to be the cheapest or the easiest. It's not a squat or, you know, uh, an alternative area or even an amateur place. It's going to be, you know, an area of the maker lifestyle. And someday there will be a lot of maker lifestyle. Oh, yeah, and of course, we, uh, we have an actual kitchen. So we're going to do ill food. We're going to have like slow food. We have like Ely chow in there, like right? the calamari cocktails. We've got the home of vermouth. We're going to have Rossini standing by. We're going to sleep there. We're going to eat there. We're going to have friends over. We're going to discuss these matters in an intimate way. And uh, you know, we have uh, we have real issues. But you know, informing a house has real problems. It's like, what kind of lock do we have? What do we do with our garden? How do we sleep? How do we handle uh, you know, sunlight issues? What do we do with the noise in the area? What do we do about our polluted area? How much can we make? You know, how do we do it? What kind of business models are there for making? How, how will Italy export 3D printed objects into other countries? Because they certainly will. What connections can we make to you know, Torino's industrial heritage? Uh, you know, how can we, I mean, Torino's a manufacturing city, how does Torino become a digital manufacturing city? What is Torino doing in the way of smart city initiatives? What does that have to do with the home? How do you sort of integrate these things from the city level to a neighborhood level to the, to the homemade level? I mean, these are, these are important issues and they, it's not just enough to teach them, they also have to be lived. And somebody has to sort of um, embody them. And the moment has come for that to happen. And it, 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 it's happening in Torino for the same reason that the fab lab happened in Torino first. This is, this is Casa Yasmin, it's the first Casa, but it will not be the last. And, you know, I, I promise you people will copy this. First in Italy, but then elsewhere. It will spread. So thank you. Thank you so much for the Professor De Martin and the next initiative, which you may be well aware or not, this is a really important work on all these topics that we're doing like concretely, as a, like you know, you're doing on, on, on theoretical plans of open source of manifestos and also this is one of the reasons why the Torino is next to us. Few reasons we want to stay here. Thank you.